Paul's letter to the Romans and chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll pick up the reading at verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, We rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. While we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, Why, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if... While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Not only so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received our reconciliation. Now on my visits here, we have been, I've been attempting to um, lead you through on some thoughts on various doctrines. This morning, I want us to think about the doctrine of justification. The doctrine of justification. Justification answers the question, how can I, a guilty sinner, be right before a holy God? How can God accept me? And it's all about having a new record in heaven. And it is one of the most important questions we can ever ask. How can I, a guilty sinner, be right before a holy God? So first I want to lead us in our thinking into this area of the law and me, or the law and us. Because when Paul writes about justification, he takes us into the law courts. He writes about condemnation and of acquittal. We're in the law courts of heaven when we think about this. The law and us. What can we say about the law, God's law? Well, we can say that the law of the Lord is perfect. We say that there's nothing bad in the law. And there's nothing good left out of the law. And so God's command that we keep the law is perfectly right and reasonable. There's nothing bad in the law, nothing good left out. But further, as we read the scriptures, we see that the law is spiritual. Unlike our human laws, our civil laws and so on, God's law is spiritual And it speaks to and it deals with our actions, yes, but also it speaks to the heart. It speaks about our affections and our motives and our intentions. The law is spiritual. It says to us, for instance, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And when I see that law, immediately I know I've got a problem because I love myself. And if we're honest, 
That is the problem we all have with that first commandment. The law says to us, you shall not covet. But the problem is, I've got greedy eyes. And once we start to look at that and consider it carefully, we realise that our law keeping then must spring from holy and pure motives. That's why we began our service by asking, the psalmist asks us that question, doesn't it? Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and the two have to go together if we are to keep the law of God but that's the problem the law for the unbeliever is an absolute disaster area the unbeliever can't keep the law either really or in his or her heart and so the Lord is spiritual it deals with our motives and our intentions as much as what we do Many years ago, we had a, a, a large blue diesel car, an estate car. And uh, being a diesel and that kind of engine, it would do 70 miles an hour if you were patient. You get onto the motorway and you sit there and slowly you wind your way up to the speed limit and you're cruising along at 70 miles an hour. At 70 miles an hour in that open limit, I've never been pulled over by the police. Sir, I want to arrest you for speeding. Officer, I was within the speed limit. I was doing 70 miles an hour. Ah, but you wanted to go faster. You can't be arrested on the motorway for intent. I might have wanted to go, for, the car wouldn't do it. And the law of, the, of God deals with our motives. It deals not only with our hands, but also with our heart. The law is spiritual. It deals with what is going on inside us. It deals with what we are like. And so the law condemns us, the law of God that is. We are lawbreakers. We are guilty. The law is spiritual. And of course, as a human being, so am I, so are you. And it is the soul that sins that shall die. And it is the soul that causes us to be condemned and under, under the wrath of a holy law giving God. And it brings to us the prospect of certain judgment. That's how we begin. Before we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are guilty and condemned. My record before I came to Christ, your record before you came to Christ was that your record in heaven was that of a lawbreaker and then therefore being liable to all the penalty of God's just law. The record of the unbeliever in heaven is that of being guilty and condemned and under the wrath of God facing judgment. Now justification in justification, we are given a new record in heaven. In justification, God steps in and by his grace, he intervenes. And by an act of grace, he first of all pardons our sins. And then secondly, declares us to be righteous in his sight. And he is able to do that because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he imputes to us. And we receive that by faith alone. Now I've used the word impute. The word impute simply means to reckon to one person what belongs to another. So in justification, Christ's righteousness is reckoned as belonging to someone else. He doesn't lose his righteousness, but that righteousness is reckoned, it is imputed to another. And so as I become a Christian, when you became a Christian, the righteousness of Christ was, was imputed as belonging to you. So we thought 
very briefly about the law and me, the law and us. Let's think about the law and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me take you in your minds, if you will, to the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is John and all his disciples and they are baptising in the river. And vast crowds have gathered on the river banks to see what's going on and to be baptised by John. Vast crowds. But as the Lord Jesus Christ rises up out of the water having been baptised, we read that the heavens are torn open, that the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and the important thing I want us to notice is that a voice speaks from heaven. The Father speaks from heaven and he says, You are my son and with you I am thoroughly and totally, I am well pleased. What the Lord God is doing from heaven is declaring what is the record of Jesus in heaven. And this is the record of Jesus' life. The all-seeing, all-knowing eyes of a holy God has observed the Lord Jesus Christ from the moment of his conception right the way through his birth, throughout all his life up until that point. And what God is declaring is his verdict upon the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's record is that his hands are clean and his heart is pure. He is perfect in himself and in all his actions. The Lord Jesus Christ has kept all of the law all of the time, both in his heart and in his actions. The law and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go from his baptism to the cross. What is going on at the cross? If we think of the cross as an altar, as an altar of sacrifice, we see that the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross is offering up that perfect life as an atoning sacrifice to the Father. Will the Father receive that offering? Will he accept that offering? Yes. The Lord Jesus Christ dies upon the cross and is buried, as we sang in our hymn book, uh, from our hymn book earlier on, but then he is raised again from the dead and the Lord Jesus Christ ascends into heaven and is now seated uh, once more at the right hand of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, what he has done, what he has offered on the cross, has been accepted by the Father. The Father raises him again to newness of life and causes him to ascend back into heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ is sinless. On the cross, he offered his perfect life as a sacrifice for the sins of others, so that they could have a perfect record imputed to their account in heaven. And so the perfect record that is spoken from heaven now becomes our record in heaven. The old record that we have of being guilty and sinful and being condemned and under wrath and, and facing judgment is expunged. It is removed to such an extent, it's as if it never existed ever before. The only record we have is the record that Jesus gives to us. And we receive that record by faith alone. There's nothing we can do to, to get that record ourselves. It is imputed to us. See how Paul puts it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It was for our sakes, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It was for our sakes 
that God made him, Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. So simple, isn't it? So clear, so obvious. It was for our sakes that God made Jesus to become sin. He didn't know any sin, but he, he, he took our sins upon him so that we might become in him the righteousness of God. And so this morning, at this point, we have answered that most important question. How can a guilty sinner be right before a holy God? Let me take you somewhere else in your minds. Let's go on to the high street, wherever it, that might be, uh, and to one of our open air uh, sessions. And one of the sessions I put up on my board, one of the preaching sessions I, I put up on the board is the big question, how can God accept me? That's the question I want everyone to ask as they walk past the open air board. How can God accept me? And underneath we have wrong and right. You see, most people, when you ask them that question on the, on the high street, how will God accept you? What do they say? Well, there's a whole range of answers, but basically um, they hope that it will be their goodness that will get them in. That's usually how they express it. How am I going to get into heaven? Well, God will look at all my goodness, and I'm hoping that there's enough goodness there for God to accept me and let me in. Wrong. Totally and absolutely, completely wrong. The right way is not to think about my goodness, but to think about my badness. And rather than thinking about my goodness, I take my badness and I say to the Lord God, here's all my badness, all of it. I can't stretch my arms out wide enough. Here's all my badness. And I'm going to put it on the Lord Jesus Christ so that he will take it away. That's utterly, totally different to what the ordinary man, the woman in the street is thinking and hoping. It's not about my goodness. It's not about your goodness. It's not about anyone's goodness except the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We take our badness and we put it on him. And his clean and pure record is then imputed to me. I'm reckoned to be as righteous as Christ is righteous. And so by an act of grace, the Lord God pardons all our sins. And he declares us to be righteous. And that is received by faith alone. He grants to us a new record in heaven. You see, there are things that God can't do as well as things God can do. God can't overlook our sin and a broken law. He simply can't. People say, oh, God can do anything. No, he can't. God can't overlook a broken law because he is holy and a just God. He is a God of justice. But there's something he can do. He can forgive and he can remove our sin by imputing the righteousness of Christ to us. And so I ask you this morning, has the Lord made that declaration about you? Have you gone with your badness, with all your sin, and have you taken it to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you asked him to take it away from you? Have you asked the Lord God to make you right in his sight for Jesus' sake? Has God made that declaration in heaven about you? Have you repented and have you received? Well, if you had, rejoice in that. Because God has given you a new record in heaven. He has justified you. He's declared you righteous. And he is the heavenly judge. When he declares us to be righteous he declares that this person is not liable any longer to pay the penalty of one who has broken the law. Rather, he says, this person is now entitled to all the privileges and all the blessings and all the duties of one who has kept all the law. 
Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? And so this morning we thought about the law and us. The law and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move on now to, to think about justification and me. His law keeping is reckoned as mine. His acceptance becomes mine. All the rights and privileges of sonship become mine. Let's continue to think a bit more about justification and me. Justification and you or us. How many times do I need to be justified and how long does it last? Quite simply, we go back to the cross. And when we do, we see that a person can be justified only once. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he hangs upon that cross and he bears all the sins of all of his people, at the end of that time on the cross, he shouts out with a loud and a triumphant voice, finished. He has finished all the work that was necessary in making me and you in making us to be right with God. And so when we look at the cross, we realise that we can be justified only once. That's all we need. Once justified, always justified. When the Lord Jesus um, completed and fulfilled his life of perfect obedience, he goes to the cross and there he offers for his people a perfect righteousness. There on the cross he receives the dread punishment for all our sins and there on the cross he makes a full payment for all our sins, past, present and future. And so when a person repents and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, from that moment on, they are declared to be legally righteous for all time and for all eternity. Now, I know I wave my arms around a lot, but let me, I'm going to wave my arms around in a particular way now. I'm going to try and draw a graph in fresh air, okay? So we have a, a start point here, and the bottom line is time. The start point is where you are converted. The start point is where you are justified by grace alone and time moves on into eternity. The vertical line, can you see it? Okay, the vertical line is 100%. And the 100% right at the top is your justification. You are 100% in the right with God. And as time moves on, that line moves along with you. So there's the vertical and the 100% moves along with you. So here it is, Sunday morning, say for instance, you've, been, you've, you've received the Lord Jesus Christ and you are justified in his faith, in his sight. Monday morning, we've moved on. It's still 100%. The end of the year, it's still 100%. At the end of the whatever, it's still 100%. You die and you go into heaven, it's still 100%. There's no gradual increase, no sharp increase in righteousness. We begin at 100%. It never dips, it never varies. That 100% travels with us at all times and in all places. That means that every moment of every day of our lives, from that moment onwards, we are fit for heaven. We are always accepted and always acceptable in the sight of God. Why? Because your record is always at 100%. And it is the record of all Christians. It is the record of every justified man, woman and child. Once justified, always justified. And I hope you... Oh, that's wonderful. Once justified, always justified. Always in the right with God. No one can take that declaration away from us. Because it is a declaration in heaven. 
But let's think a bit further. Justification and me. Justification and us. What is the outcome here on earth in terms of our justification? Well, one of the first things we can say about that is that we have peace. We have peace. Because we are always, always 100% in the right with God, we have one of the first and greatest blessings of the gospel, which is peace. God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, has made us to be at peace. Paul says, Christ came and preached peace to those who were far off and those who were near. To Jew and Gentile, Christ comes and preaches peace. Now, of course, Satan will attempt to unsettle us and to break or to remove that sense and knowledge of peace. And when we're attacked in that way, we remember that our acceptance is not due to performance. It's not about how I feel. It's not about how well or poorly I am doing in the Christian life. It is all about what God has declared about me from heaven. It is all about what God has declared about you from heaven. It's all about what the Lord Jesus Christ offered on the cross. That perfect offering for sin. That imputing that reckoning of his righteousness to my account, to your account. It is his view that is important, not ours. It is what the Lord God says about and declares about us which counts. And so when things in life go wrong, when they get difficult, as they often do, here is one place of peace and of comfort I am 100%, I've moved along, there's the, I've moved along, I am 100% in the right with God. And that brings peace to, into every and any situation. Here's this great ocean going liner. They probably have something different now, but at one time um, uh, on, on, the, on the bridge of these uh, great ocean going liners, they would have this, the gyroscope, it would be the compass. And the compass was, was in a, basically it floated in water. And water will always find its level, won't it? So it didn't matter what, what was going on outside. It didn't matter what storms or winds, what gales were battering against the ship and tossing it and throwing it all over the place. The gyro always remained level, so the captain always knew which direction he was going in. And our justification is the gyro in our Christian lives. We may be battered by all kinds of things. Our faith may be assailed. Our health breaks down. The financial crisis comes. Whatever it might be, we have that gyro. I have peace. At this point, at this place, I have peace with God. Because I am justified. Let me look at the world around us. How would you describe the world out there? How would you describe? My word is miserable. What a miserable, dear me. A society of individuals that are fractured in their relationships, they're unhappy, they're grumpy, that they're not happy about anything, campaigning about this and that, um, sorting out, correcting everybody else except themselves. And on and on it goes. It's miserable out there. Oh, but with Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have this peace. How can I, a guilty sinner, be in the right with a holy God? I am justified through the imputation of a new record in heaven. And a true inner peace comes as a result of that. True inner peace comes through having that vertical 100% that we've thought about. That's why Paul writes about joy and peace in believing, Romans chapter 15. It is our new record that counts. And so we have peace. 
But then also justification gives rise to our love for God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the work of the Holy Spirit. We love him because he first loved us. And so there is peace, but then also there is love. Love for our Saviour, love for the God who has won us through Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. Why, O Lord, such love to me? Had the conference yesterday with those, great to be with those young people uh, and just to say to them, oh, have you, do you love the Lord? Do you love him for all that he's given to you? They were all professing to be believers. And, and isn't it a mystery? Why should God single you out to show to you and reveal to you the love of Christ and, and the way of salvation through the Holy Spirit? Um, I'm so glad of the way I was introduced this morning. Um, there's one or two places that, that, that we go to and... Um, um, we welcome this morning the Lord's servant. Oh, I cringe. Um, I, just add one word, it'd be great. Unprofitable. That'd be good. I'd, I'd be happy with that. I'd be happy with that. But here we are. We, we are unprofitable as we serve the Lord. Uh, and so it, it, it heightens our love for us. He's done all of that. He sent his son to the cross. He bled and died. He suffered. The perfect man, who, the best man who ever lived, became the worst man who ever died in order that we might be justified. And he gets such a poor return on his investment in us, doesn't he? And we're bewildered by his love for us and his kindness and his patience. And so in a faint and feeble way, we love him for what he's done for us and what he's given, what he's granted and so we love the Lord. One of the results, one of the end results of justification is that we have peace, yes, but then we love the Lord. But then if we truly love the Lord, we love one another. Well, that's difficult. We love the brethren. That's one of the first things we note with those who were converted at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. There's a lovely verse in the scriptures, in the Psalms. I'll challenge you to find it. And it says this, as for the saints in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. That's challenging. As for the saints in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. And so we love the brethren. We love them with all the flaws that they have because their flaws are ours as well. And we love them because, despite their shortcomings, because their shortcomings are no worse than mine. And we learn patience. And they belong to us and we belong to them. We are brothers in Christ. We are partakers uh, of the promises of Christ. Ephesians 3, we are members of the same body. We have love for one another. It's a strange Christian who has a, a great desire to know the truth of God with precision and who can articulate so carefully and precisely the doctrine of justification but has no desire for fellowship. It's a challenge, isn't it? We love the Lord and we love one another and we, we, we learn patience and, and tolerance and gentleness. Through justification, moving on, through justification we are alive. Alive. Once we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But he has made us alive. We have come to a living faith. And because we have come to a living faith. We long that others may live too. He's Abraham in Genesis 17 verse 18. Oh, oh that Ishmael might live in your sight. We long for our children to believe. We long for them to live. And we long for the men and women, the boys and girls, the family, this community that is so dark and miserable out there. We long for them to live. Because we have experienced the love, the, the life of Christ, and we live ourselves. 
Through justification, we are adopted. Once we are in the right with God, we belong to him. And we are adopted into the royal family of heaven. Oh, what privileges that we have. We are made to be a true child of God, members of the household of faith. Which means, dear friends, this morning, we are valued. We are treasured. We are much loved as the children of God. The world out there despises us. These nutters, they're driving past us. If they think of us at all, these nutters, what they think they're doing. And they despise us. And they will ill-treat us. They have no place, no time for us. But there is a place where we are welcome and where we are loved, where we are treasured. It is in the heavenly places with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we gather together, because we share uh, these things together. Wherever we go in the world, we are a much loved and a greatly valued person. That's the antidote to low self-esteem. The world out there is struggling with self-esteem, apparently. But we have a true estimate of ourselves and of our standing and our status before God. We are able to say together, he loved us and gave his son for us. When God, the Lord God justifies us, when he makes that declaration, this one is in the right with me. He doesn't do that begrudgingly or with any reluctance. He doesn't do it because he has to. It's his idea. Justification was, is a scheme thought up by God in eternity past. It is all part of the great plan of salvation. And he declares us to be in the right with him. He adopts us into his family because he wants to and because he will forever delight in us. The world may not want you, but the heavenly father will never leave you or let you go. It's the antidote to low self-esteem. It's also the antidote to over high self-esteem. It's, it's the antidote to pride. I remember always that as a justified man, I am still a child. That I am utterly and totally dependent upon my loving Heavenly Father. I am saved, but I am a saved sinner. Yes, an unprofitable servant. And so in justification, I have a love for God, a love for the brethren. I'm made alive in Him. I'm adopted. I'm accepted then and have access. When I was going regularly into uh, the prison, as part of the chaplaincy team there, our clearance for the prison took forever, over six months. You know, what on earth these civil servants are doing in that sector? No idea. And then that clearance has to be renewed at intervals. And when I physically go into the prison, um, I have to remember uh, to um, carry my photo ID. I have to fingerprint myself in, pick up keys and go through, I forget how many, it's probably about, I think it's 12 doors or gates before I can even get onto the wing. And then every now and again, there's, there's training and refreshers. What a rigmarole. What a rigmarole. But my, our acceptance and our access to the Lord God is direct and immediate. All of that just to get into the prison. But we can get into the throne room of heaven. We're already there. We're already there. It's, it's a direct, immediate and a continuing access. So that at any time and at any place, under any and all circumstances, we can go boldly into the presence of the living God, into the throne room of heaven and offer there our worship and our praises, and there make our petitions and our prayers known. And even when we don't know how to pray, whether our emotions maybe are so high or so low, we can't speak. 
The Lord's ear is open and attentive to us. And he answers us. Why? Because we are justified. Because we are in the right with him. Because we are always in the right with him. And finally, justification and us, we have a hope. We have a hope. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5 and verses 1, 2 and 2 and then chapter 8 and 30. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the hope of the glory of God. And then chapter 8 and verse 30. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, past tense, he also glorified. Because we are justified, we have the hope of glory. I'm going to deal with this ever so briefly. The hope for a Christian is always a certainty. We have the certainty of glory. The statement that is made here is that we are justified. And the statement that the Lord Jesus makes about, or sorry, that God makes about our justification today will be the same statement that he makes about us on the day of judgment. How can I be right with God? How can God accept me? It is because I am justified. When I stand at the, the gate of eternity, uh, as I enter that eternal state, how will God accept me? He will accept me because I am justified. That is our hope. We are justified and we have the hope of glory. What God says and declares about us now is what he will say and declare about us then when Jesus comes and returns. If you are in the right with God now, you are reckoned as righteous and that can never be reversed. It can never be revoked. And that's why Paul writes in that past tense, those whom he justified, he also glorified. It is because nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear friends, this morning, are you justified? Have you gone with all your badness and taken it to the Lord Jesus Christ and put it on him? Are you justified? Then you are 100% in the right with God. Are you justified? If you are 100% in the right with God now, you will be 100% in the right with God then. We have a real and true hope of glory. Hope is certainty and in that we rejoice. Amen. Amen.